your Bibles, you can turn with me to 1 Samuel, and I hope you're able to do that today. We're going to go through a lot of uh, scripture today, and so I encourage you to follow along. If you need a Bible, we have a bookshelf in the back by the sound booth. You're welcome to pick one up and take one with you. Uh, we are going to be in 1 Samuel chapters 9 and 10, uh, looking at some important subjects. 1 Samuel is a case study in leadership. <laughs> What does godly leadership look like? What does ungodly leadership look like? What do I do when my leadership is not godly? And how can I myself be a godly leader? Uh, We are doing and focusing a a study on King David, but in order to understand King David, you have to understand the background, the setting that informed his leadership. He didn't just become a leader in a vacuum. And one of the most important figures in David's life is Saul, King Saul. And Saul is going to kind of be the antagonist to David being the protagonist. And God is going to use Saul and and shape and train David through Saul's poor leadership. Um, We looked last week at the background for Saul's calling as a king, and we discovered that there is a implication, a spiritual implication, if we want something that God allows, but we want it in our way, not God's way. There's a big difference between desiring something God wants and desiring something God wants in a way that he wants. And this is a huge theme that we see repeated over and over in 1 Samuel, uh, because, and, and it's so applicable today because our society is so good at taking something that God created to be good and right and desirable, and it's good that we want and desire those things, but then we're good at twisting it up and doing it apart from God and apart from His ways. Um, one of the, the first series that I did as a pastor here at Calvary uh, was on the Song of Songs. It was, it was really quite amazing of our elders. I mean, so I, I'm coming in, brand new pastor, and, and like, hey, what, what should we preach on? And like, hey, uh, let's strengthen marriages. And I'm like, hey, there's a whole book of the Bible that talks about love, sex, and marriage called the Song of Songs. And they're like, do it. I'm like, really? Okay. And so I just like blushed about half the time. Um, but, it, the, but the point is that, that God designed sex love and marriage to be enjoyed as gifts, but we can easily take those gifts and we twist them and we turn them into something that can be destructive. Uh, The illustration is that that of a fireplace. Fire is good. It's healthy uh, when it is experienced in the right time at the right place. For example, the fireplace. You put a fire in the fireplace, that can be a good thing. But again, right time, maybe not in the middle of the summer, but on a cold day, that's a good thing to do. Right time. It's a blessing. But if you take that fire in the wrong time and in the wrong place, you set a fire in the middle of your living room, uh uh-uh, it's not so much a blessing. It's destructive to you. It'll burn the house down. And so sex is a blessing, a gift from God, but only when it's experienced in the right time, in the right way that God intended. When you separate good things from God's design, it's harmful to us. Um, and we've, we've seen that in our society. You have uh, deep emotional scars. You have all this uh, emotional baggage, diseases, unwanted pregnancies, abortion, abuse, sex, trafficking, pornography, other addictions. And, and, and David is going to be a case study in this as well because he made some mistakes in these exact areas. So if you've made mistakes in those areas, there is hope because we're going to see uh, that, that even though there's pain and scars that are caused by not doing things God's way, that God loves to take things that we mess and twist up and then turn them and use them for his good. All right? It's not always an easy, in fact, it's never an easy uh, fix, but it can be very, very good. And so, um, you know, um, friendship's another area that we see um, God designed to be special and to be enjoyed. Uh, We're going to see a very special friendship uh, develop between David and Jonathan. If God designed men to have these deep, uh, impactful friendships with other men and and women with women, and and that is healthy and good, but our society loves to just take that and twist it and read um, things into it. They, They can't make that separation between Eros love and filial love, filio uh, brotherly love, right? The Philadelphia city of brotherly shove, or I mean brotherly love. Um, so, um, but, but those are, are, are good loves, they're a good place, but our society qu- uh, twists them. And so 
can, we, can God take something that's been broken, twisted, and make it good? That, he, that's right. So last week, we saw God's people take God's design for government, for a king in Israel, and twist it up with their own desires for a king. All right, that God designed government and, and God uh, allowed government. God said, hey, I'm your king, things are going well, but it's okay to have a human king as long as he meets these criteria. And we looked at that criteria, Deuteronomy 17. The king should have a heart that is not susceptible to materialism and greed. He should be submitted to God. He actually is commanded to write out God's law by hand and then read it every day of his life. All right, could you imagine <laughs> Could you imagine? And, but the people say, hey, don't, we don't want a king with a book. We want a king with a sword and a scepter. We want a strong man. We want somebody that can fight our battles for us. And, and, and God had just delivered the people. Uh, Samuel, as, as uh, a prophet and last judge of Israel, is saying, hey, you know, God can be your protector. God can be your king. And the people say, no. They rejected God. We want a king of our design and our making. We want the fire without the fireplace. And Samuel says, hey, here's the warnings. This is what's going to happen. You know, it, it's going to burn down the house. You're going to get burned by this. And, uh, and they say, no, we still want it. And God actually says yes. That's kind of the surprising thing. We, we would think, you know, uh, you know, God, how could you allow these people to hurt themselves? But God is a loving father. Uh, sometimes he gives us exactly what we want, even when he knows it will hurt us, in order to show us our need for him. And that's where we come to as we come to 1 Samuel 9, the coronation of a man named Saul, the, the first anointed king of Israel. And he's this foundational individual that, that God is going to use in David's life. I mean, not in a good way. Saul is a bit crazy, he starts off good, but he's going to go crazy. He's a, he's a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Uh, and he makes David's life a nightmare. He is this, this Captain Ahab chasing after the whale, mad with rage. But here is the, the main point that I want us to, to learn in, in this week and, and even next week, that, that even though you start off good, starting is not equal to finishing. All right, starting is not equal to finishing. Having a start great doesn't mean you can have a start a great finish. If you have immediate gratification, it doesn't mean that you're going to experience satisfaction. You can take off an airplane, doesn't mean it lands. Okay? Um, you can be like the, the seed that Jesus described that, that starts off great and it grows really uh, fast, but as soon as the heat of the sun comes, it withers and dies away. It doesn't finish. It doesn't bear fruit. And that's Saul's life. At the, at the, towards the end of his life, he makes the statement to David, which I think is his autobiography. He says, I've acted foolishly and I've made a great mistake. And that's kind of the autobiography of Saul's life. I've acted foolishly, I've made, a great, I've made great mistakes. And so in chapter 9 of 1 Samuel, and I'm going to go a little quick, so you know, just buckle down. It can feel like a fire hose sometime, especially if I get excited, and I, I do get excited about uh, um, First Samuel here. But um, so hold on, we'll go quick. And the faster I read Hebrew names, the more it sounds like I know what I'm talking about. So there, is, there you go. So First Samuel 9, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Ebiel, son of Zeror, son of Bechareth, son of Apihah, see, a Benjaminite, a man of wealth, and he had a son whose name was Saul a handsome young man. There was not a man among the people of Israel more handsome than he. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. So right away, there are some observations for us. First of all, did you notice he's from the wrong tribe? He, Saul is a Benjaminite. Uh, if you remember your Bible trivia back in Genesis, when Jacob is speaking over his sons, which of his sons did he say the scepter would not depart until Shiloh comes? Judah. That's right. So the king, uh, uh, the king uh, the, of which the scepter would not depart would be from Judah. But the king after the people's heart, he's from Benjamin. But he looks the part. He's the tall, dark, handsome type. He's wealthy. We see that. His dad is a man of wealth. He has donkeys. He has servants we're going to discover. So on the outside, Saul fits the bill for the king. And Scripture emphasizes his appearance. And if, if Scripture says you are more, you're the most handsome man in all Israel, this guy is stunning. 
I mean, he is Schwarzenegger, Fabio combined. I mean, he's just, he is the man's man. Like, um, I mean, you, he's, he's, you know, okay. Uh, scripture emphasizes appearance, but it's a contrast to David. And, and David, I mean, he's not unhandsome, but when Samuel actually goes to anoint David later on, God has to specifically tell Samuel, don't look at his height or appearance because Man looks at the outside, but the Lord looks at the heart. And, uh, and Samuel, he's susceptible to this. He gets caught up in the appearance because later on he's going to say, hey, look at this guy, look how good looking he is. Um, he, there's no one like him in all Israel. All right, so that's the setting. Here's the man, handsome, wealthy, uh, taller uh, from the shoulders up, right? And so you know, maybe he was normal from the you know, shoulders down, but you know, just really long, I don't know. Anyway, so 1 Samuel 9, uh, verse 3. Here's the setting, though. Uh, donkeys. Now, the donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. So Kish said to Saul, his son, take one of the young men with you. Arise, go look for the donkeys. And he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and passed through the land of Shalashah, but they did not find him. And they passed through the land of Sha'alim, but they were not there. Then they passed through the land of Benjamin, but did not find them. And so this, this donkeys are important. They wander off. Here they go. And when they come to the land of Zuf, okay, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, lest my father cease to care about the donkeys and become anxious about us. But he said to him, Behold, there is a man of God in the city, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes true. So now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us the way we should go. Then Saul said to his servant, But if we go, what can we bring the man? For the bread in our sacks is gone, and there is no present to bring the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again, Here, I have with me a quarter of a shekel of silver, and I will give it to the man of God to tell us our way. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer. For today's prophet was formerly called a seer. And Saul said to his servant, Well said, come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. So let's pause there. It's interesting, and we get a little insight into Saul's understanding of spirituality of God and of the prophet of God. Um, he, Saul is not going to be one to see himself as a servant of God, but God is a servant of him. Right? God is a cosmic vending machine to Saul. I drop in a quarter shekel, push the right button, God grants me what I want. And I think that is an application for us. How often do we do the same thing? Um, God, I'm not going to really think about you until I need something. I'm not going to pray until uh, there's something that I want. I'm not going to go to church until I'm facing a crisis. We see some of these same behaviors in our heart. Is God a means to get what we want, or are we a means to serve God? And so Saul sees this man of God, the, the prophet, as a means to get his donkeys. Uh, later on, he's going to see God and the prophet as a means to military victory. God is a vending machine to Saul. But uh, despite all this, I love how God is working behind the scenes. God is using something as mundane as lost donkeys to bring Saul and Samuel together. I, I think that's a lesson for us as well. How often do, does God use the little things in our lives to accomplish the great things for his kingdom? And, and we have our regular life, you know, we wake up, we go to school, we go to work, we have all these everyday interactions. We're like, hey, they're, they're meaningless, they're, they're, they're nothing. But God can use even those little interactions with the cashier, with the, the uh, teller at the bank, as, as divine appointments to make an impact for eternity. I think God delights in using uh, little things to accomplish his great purposes. And here it's donkeys. And so verse 11 as they went up the hill to the city, they met young women, lucky women. They meet the most handsome guy in all Israel, right? Coming out to draw water, and, and he talks to them. Is the seer here? Right? Oh, he's not talking to us. He's talking about, okay. They answered, he is. Behold, he's just ahead of you. Hurry. He has come just now to the city because the people have a sacrifice today in the high place. As soon as you enter the city, you will find him before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people will not eat till he comes, since he must bless the sacrifice. Afterward, those who are invited to eat, or after those, those who are invited will eat. Now go up, for you will meet him immediately. 
So they went up to the city. Again, timing is so perfect. They went up to the city. As they were entering the city, they saw Samuel coming out toward them on his way up to the high place. Now, again, high places, um, in, in, uh, before the Israelites came into the promised land, the, the pagan nations that were occupying the land would use these hilltops as places where they would offer sacrifices and worship Baal and Asherah, fertility gods. And um, when the, the people of God came into the land, God had to specifically tell them, don't put the tabernacle on a high place, uh, don't worship under the groves like the, like the other nations do. You're to be different than the people. But this is kind of a, a, a synchronistic practice that the people adopted from the other nations. And so the high places, even though uh, it is not the ideal for God's people, have become places of worship. There's kind of some sloppiness in the worship. Uh, later on, David's going to have a lot of work to do to kind of codify and, and make right how God's people are to worship God. So, uh, verse 15, again, God is working. The day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed to Samuel, verse 16, tomorrow about this time, so specific, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel. He shall save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have seen my people because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, the Lord told him, here is the man of whom I spoke to you. He it is who shall restrain my people. Um, how many of your translations have he will govern my people? Right, I think it's interesting that the ESV kind of took a, um, a more of the literal translation that govern actually means to restrain. Right, it's interesting that government is not intended to invent law, but to recognize divine law and restrain evil. And that's God's intention for government. Uh, we, we saw this when we looked at Romans 13, that God uh, puts rulers in place and he gives them authority and he gives them the sword to restrain evil. Right? And so God uh, uh, tells us through, through Paul in Romans 13 that we're to submit to God's governing authority. In fact, Romans 13, you look at it, God calls the ruler God's servant, from which we get the word deacon. All right? so the word deacon, the economos, means servant. And so it's interesting that the ruler of the government that Paul is writing about in Romans 13 is called God's deacon or God's servant, which is even more fascinating considering who was the ruler at the time Paul wrote Romans 13. Anyone know? Who is ruling? Who is, the, who is uh, Caesar? Nero. Ooh. Whoa. Okay. Uh, that's interesting. It's astounding. Uh, but government is set in place by God to restrain evil on behalf of God. They are ministers of God, but with a different focus. When we think of ministers, we, we, you know, we preach the gospel in order to change evil people into clean people. The government works to catch evil people. Right? They catch them, we clean them. Right? Um, but God continues to use government even corrupt government for his purposes. And our responsibility as Christians is to submit to government and pray for government. We pray for our leaders. We submit to our leaders. And our American hearts immediately go to, well, when is it okay not to submit to government? All right, how many, oh, don't raise your hands. Okay, but that, you know, that's who we are. You know, we're children of the, you know, the revolution. We want to know when can we revolt? Well, um, if if the leader, if obeying government means disobeying God, okay, that is when you obey God over obeying government. However, make sure that you know that your choice in, in interpreting, you know, or interpreting what is uh, lawful under God's law uh, disobedience is actually important and it is actually commanded because, and here's the reason, there is no protection for disobeying government promised in Scripture. That God says, I've given the government the sword, and there's no protection guaranteed for a Christian who disobeys government. And so if you say, I need to obey God rather than disobey government, yes, do that, but be willing to die for it. There you go. Uh, make sure when you disobey government, you're ready to die for that choice. All right, so be sure your convictions are based in what God says, okay? 
Uh, but God, it's amazing. God even is going to use, and we see this time through, and David is a case study in how God's people should react and view government that is not being obedient to God. But God still uses them. Proverbs 21 says, the, heart, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He directs it wherever he will. God's at work. And so the people, they're saying, give us government. We're lighting this fire in the living room. But God is still going to use it to accomplish his purposes. God says yes. Um, they say, give us a king. Give us a king. And God says, you want a king? I'll give you the king you want. All right. Um, you remember uh, uh, the Israelites in the wilderness when they, uh, they got tired of manna? And they said to God, God, give us meat. We want meat like we had back in Egypt. And, and God said, you want meat? I'll give you meat. I'm going to give you so much meat, it's going to come out of your nostrils. It's going to be loathsome to you. And he sent them so much quail, and they just get sick, you know, literally sick uh, from eating this quail. Uh, and so God, he gives them exactly what they want. The question was asked to me, well, did God choose Saul or did the people choose Saul? Well, the people had a desire, and God gave them their desire, and their desire was Saul. Sam was going to say that. Uh, verse 18, here we go in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 18. For Samuel, Saul approached Samuel at the gate and said, Tell me, where is the house of the seer? Samuel answered, Saul, I am the seer. Can't you see? All right, sorry, a dad joke. Um, okay. <laughs> go before me to the high place, for today you shall eat with me. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. As for your donkeys that were lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. As for whom is all, and here it is, as for whom is all that is desirable in Israel, is it not for you and for all your father's house? In other words, you are what the people desire. You are what Israel has been asking for. You're the guy. You're it. And Saul, I mean, he shows some humility here. Verse 21, Saul answered, am I not a Benjaminite? I'm from the wrong tribe. From the least of the tribes of Israel? You can read back in Judges and find out why they are the least of the tribes in Israel. Is not my clan the humblest of all the clans of the tribes of, of, of Benjamin? Why then have you spoken to me in this way? And so there's some humility. Hey, this, this, you know, this, why me? All right? If only he had retained that humility. All right? But Saul is going to answer and give him this illustration invites them to dinner. Saul, Samuel took Saul and his young man, brought them into the hall, gave them place at the head of the table, so he honors them, uh, who were about 30 persons. Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion I gave you, of which I said you put it aside. So the cook took up the leg and what was on it and set them before Saul. And Samuel said, see, what was kept is set before you. Eat, because it was kept for you until the hour appointed that you might eat with the guests. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. Again, very big honor, preparing the people that this guy is going to be your king. So verse 24, uh, so the, uh, the cook took up the leg, what was on it, set them before Saul, and Samuel, or, or I'm sorry, or the, or the, so Saul ate with Samuel that day, verse 25. And when they came down from the high place into the city, a bed was spread for Saul on the roof, and he lay down to sleep. Then at the break of dawn, Samuel called Saul um, on the roof, up that I may send you on your way. So Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went out into the street. As they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servant to pass on before us, and when he passed on, stop here yourself for a while, that I may make known to you the word of God. I'm going to private word, and then in chapter 10, verse 1, then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head and kissed him and said, has not the Lord anointed you to be prince over his people Israel? Now, again, when you anoint people in this day and age, it's not like you dip your finger in a little bit of oil and dab it on his finger. They poured you know, this flask of oil over his head and it runs down on his hair and into his beard. And it's a symbol of, of authority and consecration that the God's blessing is upon you. Right? And so when we talk about someone being anointed by God, it's like you don't even see the person anymore. All you can see is God's authority and blessing upon that person. And so Samuel then is going to give some signs to Saul. Right? He says, you shall reign over the people of the Lord. You will save them from the hand of their surrounding enemies. And this shall be the sign to you that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. When you depart from me today... 
You will meet two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zelzah, and they will say to you, the donkeys that you went to seek are found, and now your father has ceased to care about the donkeys and is anxious about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Um, and, And again, all these signs, as amazing as they are, it's an indication that Saul is not the guy that's gonna take this at God's word at face value. And he's not gonna even accept it with one sign. Samuel's gonna give him three. First of all, you've been looking for these donkeys. You're gonna meet these two strangers. They're gonna say this at this place at this time to confirm this message. Sign number two, verse three. Then you shall go on from there farther and come to the oak of Tabor, specific place. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a skin of wine. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall accept from their hand. Very specific. And and don't miss the importance of this. I mean, imagine if someone came up to you, dumped oil on your head, and told you this specific thing. You're going to go, you know, uh, know, down to West Rutland, and you're going to meet two guys at this specific tree here, and and they're going to be carrying this specific thing, and give you two, and they're going to say this to you. You'd be like, whoa, who is this guy? What is happening? But Saul, I mean, you don't get that. Third sign. (laughs) If that's not enough, third sign, verse 5. After that, you shall come to Gibeath Elohim, where there is a garrison of the Philistines. All right, so now you're going into, uh, and there is this, this enemy territory, enemy soldiers. And there, as soon as you come to the city, you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with harp, tambourine, flute, and lyre before them prophesying. Now, I, I think that's interesting. I think it would be a good uh, um, area for further study if anybody's watching there that wants to work on their doctorate. This would might be a good area. Uh, the link between music and prophecy in the Old Testament. All right, what, what is the link? Because uh, it's several times throughout Scripture. Uh, Miriam, she's called a prophetess, and she sings this song. Uh, Deborah, one of the judges, called a prophetess. All Judges chapter 5, she sings a song. First uh, Chronicles 25, where David installs Asaph and some others as worshipers in the temple. Um, they're called prophets, and they are uh, dedicated with musical instruments, harps, uh, cymbals, lyres. And here, these prophets, they have musical instruments, and Samuel says, Saul, you're going to join them. You're going to be like them. The Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you, verse 6, and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. All right, so we got Schwarzenegger, Fabio, and all of a sudden, he's Justin Timberlake. You know, he's, he's singing, he's dancing, a tambourine, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, tall, rancher, handsome dude. Uh, you know, and it's just fascinating how, you know, what happens when the Spirit of the Lord turns people into different men and women. Um, and, and we see that today. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new what? Creation, the old has gone. The new has come. And, and, and for us in the New Testament, it's, it's a permanent change. God changes your heart, gives you a new identity. A new, uh, and, and, and some of you who were saved later on as teenagers or adults, you can remember, I was like this, now I'm like this, and I'm completely different. Right? I mean, for me, I was, I was uh, uh, fortunate to be saved when I was five, you know, and, and part of me always wished, oh, I wish I had this more dramatic testimony. I don't know, maybe I was uh, the ruffian at four. Uh, we'll see. But, you know, I, I didn't go from, like, gang member to, you know, uh, to preacher, you know. <laughs> um, I was a young kid. But some of you have those dramatic stories. But whether you were saved as a young kid or uh, older, it is still a miracle of God. Right? There's nothing to be embarrassed about or wish that you had a different testimony. It is a special and amazing a change, a miracle of God, as you can imagine. But in Old Testament times, God's Spirit, you, you weren't sealed by the Spirit in the Old Testament. God's Spirit could come and go upon a person. And we're going to see with Saul. It, it, it rests on Saul, and he's going to uh, uh, act in accordance with the Spirit of God. And then, it, it, and then as, uh, as Saul quenches the Spirit, uh, the Spirit leaves him. And we're going to see that as well. And so Samuel tells Saul, different man. And uh, verse 7, when, you, when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming down to you to offer burnt offerings and... Uh, and sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what to do. 
when he turned his back to leave Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all these signs came to pass that day. Great start. Amazing. Uh, God is just showing Samuel and Saul that, that, that God is, is divine and sovereign and you can trust God. And when you submit to God, things are going to go good. And so sure enough, all this happens. Verse 10, uh, uh, it says, When they came to Gibeah, behold, a group of prophets met him. The Spirit of God rushed upon him, and he prophesied among them. And all who knew him previously saw how he prophesied with the prophets. And the people said to one another, What has come over the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And a man of the place answered, And who is their father? And now he would just said, His father is Kish. But now this guy's like Justin Timberlake. And who, where did this guy come from? You know, he's not the guy we thought he was. He's a different man. Therefore, it became a proverb, Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. And at that point, apparently, Saul's dad, again, had been um, concerned, anxious about him. And so apparently he sends out another search party now for his son. Because in verse 14, Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, where would you go? Now listen to his answer. He said to seek the donkeys. And when we saw that they were not found, we went to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, please tell me what Samuel said to you. And we know what Samuel said. All right? Yeah, he addressed the donkeys, but he also dumped a vat of oil over him and kissed him and told him he was going to be king over Israel. And all these signs, you know, the, the, the crux of the story is what, what, uh, all that. But Saul said to his uncle, he told us plainly that the donkeys had been found. Crickets. But about the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel had spoken, he did not tell him anything. Left out all that other, other stuff, the whole Justin Timberlake thing, let's not talk about that. And, and uh, some people say, well, oh, how humble a guy is Saul. Um, no. All right, he is, he's not talking about, he's like, okay, maybe this was just some bad dream. I don't want this. I don't want this. And there's a lesson for us too. How often does God do a miracle in your life, do something amazing, and we're like, I'm not going to talk about that. All right. Uh, and and uh, the testimony that we get in the Gospels, you know, when, when Jesus saw that, you know, when he healed the demoniac and, and he said, you know, go to your home, to your household and tell your friends and family about the God's mercy. Have we shown great mercy to you? Tell people what God has done for you. Uh, we, we saw what happened to the generations of Israel. There arose a new generation that did not know Joshua, that did not know Moses, that did not know how God had rescued his people. Why didn't they know? Because the parents, the grandparents, the, the, the community, they did not tell what God had done in their own lives. So tell each other what God is doing in your life. Parents and grandparents, tell your kids how God saved you, how the miracles he accomplished in your life, how you saw him work, how you saw him direct you. Share what God has done. And, and you get the sense, you know, Saul, he doesn't want this. He doesn't want to acknowledge God even after all this. But he can't hide. He can't hide. Verse 17, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah, and he said to the people of Israel, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt. He's reminding them, okay, what God has done. I brought up Israel out of Egypt. I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today, you have rejected your God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses, and you have said to him, set a king over us. You know, Samuel's like, I'm not going to let you guys forget, all right, that uh, God has done all these things, and he's delivered you, and he's been your king, and all these amazing things have happened, and you have rejected him by wanting a king of your own making, all right? You're going to get exactly what you want. When things don't work out for you, Israel, don't forget this was a rejection. This was your rejection of God. Now, therefore, he says, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. All right, and, and uh, this is one of the ways that God would reveal his will. We saw that with Jonah and some other things that they would uh, have, have the, the Umen and the Thurman, and it would be kind of a yes or no answer. And, uh, and they would go through the tribes, and they would do this many times, and eventually it lands on Benjamin. Right? And so he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans, and the clan of the Matrites were, was taken by Lot, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. 
So they inquired again of the Lord, is there a man to come? And the Lord said, behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. This is so funny. This is so good. Uh, first king of Israel, the one who's going to rescue his people, restrain evil, lead them into battle. Where is he? He's in the luggage area, right? He's hiding. Again, you know, this is not humility. This is weakness. It's faithlessness. This is a man who God told what he was going to. God told him what he was going to do. Uh, he anointed him. All these signs, and this guy is he's trying to play Jonah and thwart God. He's hiding. And it's and, the uh, same today. If God calls you to do something and you hide from God, if you run from God, that's not humility. It's a weakness. It's sin. I mean, Jonah, well, we don't say, well, you know, he's being so humble and righteous when God told him to go preach to the Ninevites and he went the opposite. No, he, he, was, he was sinning against God. It was selfish of him. So he's a childish coward. I mean, this is what little kids do when they don't want to do something you tell them to do. They go and they hide they try to get over, and so Saul is, is, is doing this. So they ran, and they took him from there, verse 23, and when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upward, and Samuel said to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people, and the people, all the people shouted, long live the king. We're just going to forget about the hiding in the baggage part, you know. Uh, look at the sky, you know, his, his courage, his, his, his disobedience to God, to forget that. He looks like a king. And Samuel gets caught a bit too. I mean, he's Fabio, he's Arnold, he's Justin Timberlake. He's what you want in a leader. And, and, and again, the contrast between David is so astounding. David, he doesn't run or hide from danger. He runs toward danger. He doesn't reject God's calling upon his life. He, he accepts God's calling even when he knows uh, how difficult it's going to be. He fights off wild animals, uh, fulfilling his calling as a shepherd when nobody's looking. And so verse 25, Samuel told the people the rights and duties of kingship. Uh, Maybe he read them Deuteronomy 17. This is what a king should do. He should write out God's word. He should read it every day. He shall not be lifted up among his brethren. He shall not collect horses and materials and all these things. And he wrote them in a book and laid it up before the Lord. Man, how, what would our society be like if our government, if our lawyers um, had this criteria that they had to know God's law. Um, I don't know if you knew that. In our, in, um, in, when you look back at history, the, the oldest schools started off as seminaries. And, you know, the, the biggest, you know, law, the most famous law schools in our country, they started off as seminaries. And the idea was that you can't practice man's law until you first understand God's law. I, you know, what if that was still uh, the... the, the happen today? I mean, how things have changed. What would our, our Senate and, and our Congress look like? Um, over a third of our House of Representatives have law degrees. Over half of our Senate has law degrees. What if they all had to go to, you know, not, not all seminaries are created equal, but what if they understood God's law before they uh, represented us? What if they had hearts submitted to God and pray for them? So Samuel sent all the people away, each one to his home. Saul also went to his home at Gibeah, and with them went men, I love this, men of valor whose hearts God had touched. But some wordless fellow said, how can this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no present, but he held his peace. All right. uh, this is the way of leadership. All right. Whenever uh, you lead people, you're going to make changes. And some people are going to say, yes, we're with you. We're quick adopters. Some are going to be very slow adopters. Most people are kind of in the middle, kind of like a bell curve. But at the very end, there are people that no matter what you do or what you say or how good a leader you are, they will say no. And, and, and usually it is at, 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 uh, at minimum 2% of people are always going to say no, no matter uh, how you lead or, or what you do. And uh, what do leaders tend to do? Do they focus on the 98% who said yes? Nuh-uh. They, they fixate on the 2% who say no. And you get the sense that Saul, you know, even though he holds his peace here, you get the sense that he's quietly smoldering underneath. And, and later on, he's going to be paranoid. Uh, he's insecure. He sees enemies in every shadow. And, but leaders need to recognize Okay, don't focus on the 2%. Look at what God has done. Um, And God has raised up men of valor whose hearts he has touched. All right, don't fixate on the 2%. And I love that. When when God asks you to lead, 
look at what he's given you. Uh, don't be the worthless fellow uh, it, when you're following people. Be the man or woman of value whose heart God has touched. Right? Because when you surround yourself with valiant people whose hearts God has touched, I mean, that kind of leadership, that kind of uh, uh, organization can accomplish just about everything. I, I love that about our elders. I, you know, I, I, would, I would say they are all men of valor whose hearts God has touched. I want that in our, our future elders. I want that in our deacons, our deaconesses. This is what every Christian should be. This is what the disciples were. God had, had changed them, and they were ordinary fishermen with a tax collector thrown in for good measure. Uh, but when uh, the Holy Spirit came upon them, they were changed into men of valor. They went in the world, and they accomplished a global change. And Jesus, I mean, he was a, a divisive leader. He was the most loved and most hated leader who ever lived. But those who love him, whose hearts have been touched by him, we are called to be valiant men and women of God whose hearts God has touched. We're God's people. And God doesn't need multitudes and multitudes of people. Um, 2 Chronicles uh, 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose hearts are blameless toward him. And so the church you know, is, is meant to be engaged and valiant and, and active. We're, we're not meant to be like a football game where you have 80,000 people who desperately need more exercise watching 80 people on the field who desperately need a break. All right, that, that is not where we're meant to be. Don't be the worthless spectator. Don't hide in the baggage. Don't disregard all the miraculous works that God has done in your life. If God has touched your heart, be the man or woman of valor. And, and if God has not touched your heart, if he has not changed your heart, maybe today is the day of salvation where you would say, God, you've been calling me, and I want you to touch my heart and change me into the new man to give me your Holy Spirit, and I surrender to you. I believe, Jesus, that you paid the penalty for my sin, that you died on the cross, that you rose again. Thank you for that. I turned from my sin and turned to you. Be my king. And God says, yes, anyone who calls in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. And he changes your heart, gives you your spirit, and now you have the power to be that valiant man or woman of God, to go out and change the world. Call out to him in faith today. But if God has already changed your heart and you're a spectator, you're acting like a worthless fellow in the sidelines, you know, being the church means acting like the church. We don't sit on the sidelines. We're, we're valiant men and women of God. We burn brightly for Jesus. And that's not easy. It means people are going to mock you. It means persecution. But your life will matter because God will start using you and you'll start seeing lives changed for eternity. Best investment you can make. Jesus said, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust and, and uh, thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. Right? What, what kinds of treasures do we store up in heaven? Well, I would say there are two things in this world that are eternal. The word of God and the souls of people. Two things that are eternal. The word of God and the souls of people. If you want to finish well, invest in those things. You can run the race well, but our life only matters if we finish well. And I, you know, Paul, I mean, he had a rough start. He had a rough start, but God touched his heart. He changed him. He became a man of valor. And at the end of his life, he could say, I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father God, I want to pray for anyone who has recognized today that they have been hiding from you. You have been calling them, but maybe they've been crippled by fear. I pray that you'd help them to recognize that today is the day of their salvation. Help them to call out to you in faith to let you touch their hearts and change them into the man or woman that you want them to be. And if that's you, you can call out to God in, in, in faith, and that's all prayer is, is just talking to God. And I, I can lead you in a prayer right now. You can say something like this after me. Lord, I give you my life. I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. 
I believe that Jesus died for me, that he rose again. I repent, I, I turn to Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow him as my King, as my Lord. And if you've prayed a prayer like that at any point in, in your life, but you have not been living as Jesus as your King, I'd like to just lead you in another prayer of rededication so that you can get right with God and be the man or woman of valor that God called you to be. You can pray along with me in your hearts by faith, something like this. Father God, thank you for saving me. Thank you for touching my heart. I'm sorry that I have not been following you as I know I should. I want to be a man, a woman of valor who lives for you by faith, not fear. Thank you for sealing me with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I ask you to fill me to control me, to make me more like Jesus every day. Help me to be selfless in the way I love others around me. Help me to use my gifts to bless and equip your church and build your kingdom. I ask this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Okay, men and women of valor, if you're ready to take the next step, I encourage you to sign up in the back to reach out to us online. But go love others, represent Jesus, go be the church. We'll see you next week.